Good evening, and thank you for that warm welcome. Uh, this is an amends visit. We were scheduled to do this earlier, and unfortunately, some unplanned surgery on my part prevented me from being here. Uh, but the recovery's gone very well, and I'm delighted that Jim invited me back to, uh, to do, the, do a, a sort of a, a, a round two of this attempted presentation. So it's a pleasure. I, I uh, obviously entered the, the world of addiction treatment and recovery very early in my life, um, early in my own recovery. And in addition to catching recovery, that's right, I didn't choose it. I caught it like some of you did in spite of myself. Uh, I also caught the history bug. I was part of the rise of early modern addiction treatment in the early 1970s and felt we were doing this incredibly pioneering work for the very first time. You know, of course, I had some understanding that, you know, the, the birth of AA in the mid-1930s and, and multiple births of NA through various, you know, periods of history. But I thought this thing called treatment, the way we were doing it as a large national system of care, was something radically new. And, uh, and, and felt that, you know, for some years into my early professional work in the field. I was at a flea market um, on a Saturday morning, um, wandering by a table, and I looked down, and there was an old yellowed advertising brochure for something called an inebriate asylum. <laughs> and I read it, and all of a sudden, I had, I mean, there was this incredible epiphany. Here was this addiction treatment program that had existed more than a century earlier. I was one of those rising young bucks in the addiction treatment field, and not a single person had told me that this treatment world existed a century earlier. So my thought was, well, maybe, you know, as a kind of service to the field, I'll try to research, like, what were those places? What were the treatment methods, for God's sakes, a century earlier? And maybe I'd write a little paper on that. And that was my sort of resolution to myself in 1974. What I didn't know was that that little research paper would take 20 years of research and end up in a book called Slaying the Dragon. As part of that work with that history, when I got into the later parts of this, I tracked down uh, a historian, Ernie Kurtz, uh, from Ann Arbor, Michigan, and began to collaborate with him on, uh, as my sort of mentor and consultant on the, particularly the AA chapters, and got to visit Ernie in AA, and Ernie said, you know, I'm, a, I'm on the board of an organization that I think you'd be very fascinated with called Don Farm. Why don't we go over to the farm and meet the pigs? And I, I said, pardon? And so that was my first introduction to Don Farm. And since then, we've had this long, wonderful relationship with Don Farm and staff and many of the, the current and former clients that have gone through Don Farm. So, so thank you, Don Farm, for bringing me back to Ann Arbor to, to do this evening. We're going to try to do um, two things tonight. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to talk about the history of recovery in the United States. Um, and I want to talk about some transformations that are occurring within the culture of recovery in the United States that are without historical precedent. If I was going to do a summary of my presentation, I would say to you that for almost three centuries, we've had these sort of dichotomized things in terms of resolution of severe alcohol and drug problems, one called the history of recovery mutual aid in America, and the other one called the history of professionally directed addiction treatment, with a very complex history each, and very complex and at times very strained relationships between those two that I'll touch on off and on tonight. But that's sort of been the world. And what I'm going to suggest by the end of the presentation this evening is there are some innovations right now emerging that are without historical precedent. There are new recovery support institutions and a new recovery culture emerging that transcends the recovery fellowships in the United States, where people stand up and no longer see themselves necessarily as just members of AA or NA or Women for Sobriety or Secular Organization for Sobriety or on and on, but actually are for the first time sort of coming up, becoming awakened culturally and politically and standing up as people in recovery or families in recovery and building new recovery support institutions that are not recovery mutual aid and not professional treatment. 
So we're going to talk about how this space, if you will, between treatment and recovery mutual aid is beginning to get filled in. And at the very end, we'll say, you know, what are the implications of some of these changes for the future of recovery in the United States and the future of treatment? I, I want to begin by paying homage to how deep and how far back the, the history of recovery goes in the United States. Uh, the history of addiction also goes back very, very far. In fact, you might be interested, the very first populations of people that I can find that signaled alarm related to their alcohol and drug use and sort of met today what we would call addiction and began to generate state responses by way of state or colonial laws were two interesting groups, and they were clergy and they were physicians. This was at a time in the, in the American history where alcohol was ever present, and alcohol was involved in every social ritual and every interaction. And physicians and clergy often plied their trades moving from home to home. And in every home they entered, alcohol was offered. It would have been great social offense to turn down alcohol. And I can assure you the level of spiritual care and medical care in the mornings was far superior to that as the day progressed, you know, during this time period. So we actually began to have some real alarms around these problems of impaired physicians and impaired clergy. But we don't have much, we don't have much evidence of a fully developed concept of addiction. And we have virtually no concept of recovery until we get into the 1730s. And that's not going to happen in, in, in Euro-American colonies. It's really going to happen in Native American communities. And I know this is, this is a very difficult piece of this history to do because it is so complex. Um, when I began to collaborate with Native American communities on writing a book on the history of recovery among Native American tribes, the conclusion I came to after our first year of research was virtually everything I had been taught about the relationship between alcohol and Native American tribes was simply flat out wrong. Uh, what I need to tell you is early on, alcohol was not a significant problem among Native American tribes. It was a token of intercultural contact. We did not begin to see the rise of significant alcohol problems until alcohol became used as a tool of political and economic and sexual exploitation of Native people as those tribes came under cultural assault and began to disintegrate through this kind of genocidal uh, war being waged against them and communities devastated by, by, by physical assault and disease began to virtually lose their cultures. We began to see the dramatic rise of alcohol and drug problems in tandem with that. Is there a lesson for us today? Because that's a pervasive thread in the history of addiction in the rise of, of increased community disorganization, right? The, the disintegration of families and extended families and kinship neighborhoods and value homogenous neighborhoods. What can we expect with alcohol and drug problems as that occurs? They're going to rise. What happened in the Native American communities in response to that? Because there's sort of this image that we rolled barrels of rum and whiskey off of the boats and devastated Native America, who were simply passive victims to this raging alcoholism. And in fact, nothing could be farther from the truth. There were significant political and cultural responses to the rising alcohol problems. And among those were the very first recovery mutual aid societies in the United States. These began with Native American recovery circles in the 1730s. They're going to be followed by, the most, one of the most significant of these is going to emerge in 1798 with the Handsome Lake Movement. And what all of these movements that I'm going to describe to you shared was framing a radical abstinence from alcohol as an act of political and cultural survival. And so what this were, were, it were individuals who, who in, in recovering themselves, who then rose up to launch Native American religious and cultural revitalization movements founded on two things, radical abstinence from alcohol, a rejection of, uh, of all the other European trappings and a, and a re-embrace of Native traditions. This early Handsome Lake movement is going to move into the 1800s, followed by the Shawnee Prophet movement, the Kickapoo Prophet movement, onto the Indian Shaker Church, the Native American Church, 
And, and I want to just continue briefly this history all the way through the 20th century, and really beginning in the 50s, we begin to see a dramatic, what I call the Indianization of Alcoholics Anonymous, this cultural adaptation of 12-step recovery in many Native American communities. And that actually extends today to the modern well-briety movement in Native American, particularly in Indian country uh, today. So we have almost continuous recovery movements within Native communities throughout this time period that I'm reviewing. In, in the Euro-American culture, we see the first uh, Native auto, or the first American autobiographies of recovery uh, beginning in the 1830s. And by way of setting this in context, it's important to know that between about 1780 and 1830, per capita alcohol consumption jumped from about, about two and a half gallons per person per year to more than seven gallons per person per year, which is almost four times our current level of drinking in the United States. So in that context, we're gonna have alcoholism rising rapidly, a, a recognition of the medical disorder that will later be christened alcoholism, and these early recovery movements. We begin to get the first recovery biographies in the 1830s. Then in 1840, uh, six men who were part of a drinking club at the Chase Tavern in Baltimore, Maryland, get in a huge argument over the proposition that all temperance lectures are hypocrites. Can you see this happening? People are about, about three sheets in the wind involved in this deep philosophical debate about the temperance lectures of the time who are all, by the way, physicians and ministers for the most part in these years. And one of them, at this point, gets a great idea. And he says, we should start our own temperance society, but only for hard cases. Now, we don't have, alcoholism hasn't been coined in 1840. So hard cases represents what today we would call alcohol dependence or alcoholism. So they, they set a time to meet, they met the next morning, and they organized the Washingtonian Temperance Society. And that society grew from these six men to more than 400,000 members in 48 months. And within another 24 months, they'd imploded and almost disappeared with the exception of a couple of northeastern cities. In that same time period between 1935 and, 19, 1935 and 1939, AA in the same time period will have less than 100 members compared to the 400,000 of the Washingtonians. We're going to see when the Washingtonians imploded, the recovering people went underground in what were then called fraternal temperate societies. And some of these societies were specifically organized by men, men in recovery for the most part. Women have not yet shown up on the scene yet. Uh, organized by men in recovery for men in recovery. So these are these little closed uh, sober fellowships that actually function quite well in terms of social support and keeping some of these individuals uh, maintaining their sobriety. But they really became less and less relevant. And part of it was they became quite closed groups. And some of them developed very exclusive rules for membership. I've actually got some flyers of groups that said they only wanted drunkards of good repute <laughs> to be part of their groups. Now, I don't know about you, but I've actually run into a few meetings where I thought that policy had continued forward. But. As the recovery-focused temperance societies became less relevant, and by the way, this is a theme, and the theme is when systems of recovery support collapse in American history, out of the ashes of that support, will, will recovering people will rise from those ashes and begin immediately to rebirth new systems of recovery support. So if everything we know today from professional treatment to AA and NA and the secular and religious recovery pathways I'll describe to you, if they collapse today, tonight, I promise you tomorrow out of those ashes, recovering people would rise and rebirth systems of support once again. The Ribbon Reform Clubs were what got rebirthed out of the collapse of the fraternal temperance societies. And they were known for wearing a particular colored ribbon both that when they traveled, they could recognize each other and offer sober fellowship for each other. And secondly, to send a signal to the larger community that long-term recovery was a reality. And what I'm going to tell you is it will be more than 130, 40 years later before we get that message returning within the American culture. 
We also had institution-based recovery support groups. And a, the, the early treatment of addiction is going to emerge in, in four forms. We're going to get, we're going to get inebriate homes that are very close to what today we would call our recovery residence, right? A subject close to some of our hearts here, right? And the recovery residences uh, are going to be very closely associated with the Washingtonians or the Ribbon Reform Clubs. They tend to be small homes, sh very short lengths of stay, really relying on sort of sober fellowship, uh, and, and also a, a unique pattern of mentorship that we'll later see rebirth within, within AA. Uh, within these homes. Secondly is we're going to have medically directed inebriate asylums. These are the first real medical institutions specialized for the treatment of addiction. These are going to begin in 1864 uh, with the opening of the New York State Inebriate Asylum. And we're going to have inebriate asylums beginning to spread across the United States. Third is we're going to have private for-profit addiction cure institutes whose primary purpose is to make money. Right? They've got stockholders, they're going to make money, they're going to make money treating this disorder. The largest of these is the Keeley Institutes that are going to be replicated in more than 120 communities in the United States and in Europe. But there were many Keeley competitors, com competitors, the Gatlin Institutes, the Neal Institutes, the Oppenheimer Institutes, and many of these, by the way, were in existing in Michigan, in the state of Michigan, more than a century ago. Within these multiple, by the way, we also had bottled and boxed home cures for the alcohol and drug and tobacco habit. Uh, do you have any speculations of what might have been in some of those home cures? Um, it's very interesting. They were aggressively marketed by the same patent medicine industry that was addicting a large segment of our population through patent medicines loaded with alcohol and opium and morphine and cocaine and you set chloral hydrate and the new barbiturates that were just arriving around 1903. Um, but within the, within the inebriate homes and asylums, we had patients who began to come together and organize their own recovery support societies. So we have groups like the Olipod Club that was associated with the New York State Inebriate Asylum. <laughs> this is the first recovery mutual aid group born inside a treatment center in the United States. We had the Godwin Association. The Keeley Leagues were the largest of these, about 30,000 members scattered across more than 20 states, very vibrant through the 1890s, but disintegrated in the late 1990s when the director, founder of the Keeley Institute, Dr. Leslie Keeley, attempted to hijack the Keeley Leagues to use as a marketing framework for his Keeley Institutes. Uh, one, of the, one of the many chapters of the precarious relationship between treatment and mutual aid in the United States. I want to give you just a few visual images. This is a, the first recovery case studies in the United States that I've been able to locate. 1833, and these are case studies from local temper, a local temperance society in Boston of people who were, who were town drunkards who were sobered up through their affiliation with various temperance groups during this time period. This is a picture of, the, of a typical Washingtonian meeting. You'll notice the classic scene in the middle here with the desk and the, 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 the inkwell and the pen and the pad. And the pad is for signing the pledge. The entire focus of these early movements was on getting people to sign a lifelong pledge of abstinence from alcohol. Now, it's a little tricky because the first pledge is you were only pledging to abstain from distilled alcohol. You could drink all the wine and beer and cider that you wanted. When that little experiment didn't work real well, I know some of you have actually tried that same experiment more recently. When, when, when that experiment didn't work very well, they came back by the, by the time we get to 1835, 40, almost all of these groups have now migrated towards the total temperance pledge, which means you are pledging abstinence from all that intoxicates. What they didn't understand at this point was the distinction between this, that what it takes to maintain recovery is very different than what it takes to initiate recovery. And we still have people who haven't quite figured that out today. This is a typical pledge card. This is the Murphy pledge card from the Blue Ribbon Reform Club. 
uh, gospel temperance, and I want to read, uh, I, the undersigned, do pledge my word and honor, God helping me, sounds like a step to me, <laughs> to abstain from, and notice the term all is capitalized. And this is really emphasizing that transition now to total abstinence among these recovery support <laughs> groups. As I talk about this early, mid 19th century history, uh, we talked about the, the Native American recovery his, uh, work is, is very, very active during this time period. And people are often asking me, particularly in African American audiences, well, what, what's the status of African Americans during this time period? And it, it's, a, it's a very detailed story. I actually have some collaborators that are working on doing a book on the history of recovery within African American communities. One of the things we stumbled on was that as we began to as increasing numbers of freed slaves appeared in this culture, the access to alcohol became linked to one's freedom status. So we did begin to see the rise of alcohol problems among freed slaves by the time we get to, say, the 1840s, 1850s. We also began to see patterns of, uh, an interesting pattern of drunkenness. We have almost no reports of, of alcoholism among African Americans. In fact, there were early reports that, they, that African Americans were so sober in their demeanor that it was thought they were incapable of intoxication, which was attributed not to racial superiority, of course, but racial inferiority, which was interesting because we were also at that time attributing Native American vulnerability to alcoholism. To, you, you hear what I'm going here? I mean, crazy, crazy kind of logic here. but. But in the midst of this, as, as in most cultures, when we get these problems rising, we will begin to get indigenous recovery movements rising within those cultures. And we began to try to pinpoint, where do we get visible, significant recovery beginning in the African American community? I hope everybody can recognize this person who's up here. In, in my love of history, he's one of the most amazing human beings this earth has, has ever produced. Uh, this is Frederick Douglass. We have a fascinating uh, piece that I wish I had more time to describe to you, but here's the summary. We know, we know that Frederick Douglass had a period of, of significant intemperance in his life. He's described that in his multiple autobiographies. We know in, in 18, 1845, he signed a temperance pledge. We know by all accounts, from all accounts that are available, that he never consumed alcohol again for the rest of his life. And we know he was very active in what was called the colored temperance movement of the second half of the, of the 19th century. And so the question we began to raise was, was that recovery? And we just kind of hesitated and we, there were just these hints that we, could, we just couldn't quite nail it down. We were reading all of his speeches from all across the United States and we got all these suggestions that would let us, we think he is, and then we ran across his speeches in Scotland. <laughs> And there it was, he just laid it out. For some reason, much more comfortable talking about his personal history outside the United States than he was from the platform inside the United States. And he describes in very vivid terms um, how that, that, that he knows the drunkard's walk. <laughs> you know, and he, and he goes on and on in describing this decision. And he became a very powerful force. And basically was the first person to put recovery within a kind of Afrocentric framework. Frederick Douglass believed sobriety was absolutely essential for black citizenship in the second half of the 19th century. And much of his work, he really believed this was a personal act, but it was also a deeply political act, and that the, the survival of African Americans in this culture during that period hinged on, on sobriety as they moved out of slavery. This is an this is a, a illustration from one. Uh, this is the Keeley Leagues in 1890. I love the sign. I, I have to admit, one of the real joys you have in this archival research is you can wade through, you know, dusty, battered boxes for hours through garbage, and then all of a sudden you open a package that hasn't been opened in 60 years in some archive, and you find a photograph like this. And it says the law must recognize that a leading fact medical, not penal treatment, reforms the drunkard. Mm -hmm. I discovered this in the middle of the 1990s when we were trying to incarcerate our way out of a cocaine addiction problem in this country. And I thought, maybe it's time I just sort of reproduce this 
and ran it around to every policy and law enforcement person in the country. Faith-based people. We're going to talk about faith-based recovery in the United States. Uh, and I want to go back and talk a little bit about the birth of that. Actually, it starts pretty early, but we don't have much detail. What we do know in colonies like Virginia, for your first arrest for drunkenness, you would be, you would be pr privately rebuked. For the second offense, you would be publicly rebuked, including wearing a D on your clothing for drunker. <laughs> the third offense, depending on where you were at, is you would get referred either to a physician or a clergy, but mostly, most of the time to a clergy. And what's our assumption here? The assumption here is a kind of moral framework of excessive drinking is a sin. That sin could, would only be amenable to religious salvation, and therefore the person who would be culturally responsible for this problem would be the clergy. So we get these early referrals, but we don't have evidence of, of faith-based recovery mutual aid this early at all. But we do get evidence of this beginning in the 1870s. One of the pioneers for this movement was Jerry McCauley. Jerry McCauley was a, a, an alcoholic most of his adult life. He was arrested for highway robbery and imprisoned in Sing Sing Prison. While he was in prison, he met another per alcoholic by the name of Orville Awful Gardner, who became famous for having bitten a man's ear off in the boxing ring. Yeah, I know what you're thinking, but let's go. I want to go there. Uh, he, Jerry, uh, encounters Orville, who, who basically checked his alcoholism through a conversion to Christianity. When Gardner left, he went to New York City and he started an organization called the Drunkards Club. And in the Drunkards Club, more than 400 recovering alcoholics a day came into what today we call a clubhouse, right? Huge. And that clubhouse was a thriving recovery center until Gardner suddenly got sick from the tuberculosis he'd contracted in prison and died. And by the way, with him, that club died, which is part of the history that I want to weave to you about any of these societies that are organized around a single charismatic figure have a very precarious existence. But through his influence, when Jerry got out of prison, like a lot of people, he had a conversion in prison. And then when he got out, he began immediately drinking and had another couple of conversions. Stuff. And one of those conversions, he had a vision. And his vision was of a physical place where people as depraved as himself could come and be physically and emotionally and spiritually cleaned up and be afforded the kind of opportunities for religious salvation that he had experienced. And what he did was he, he made that vision a reality. He opened the Water Street Mission in New York, in, in, in New York City. Uh, what will later be called Hell's Kitchen in New York City, one of the most, you know, sort of the Bowery or Skid Row of some of today's cities. Um, that, that marks the beginning of churches in the United States developing specialized ministries to alcoholics. And we're going to get strong recovery mutual aid groups pairing with those early missions. And they're going to go all the way up through some of my personal favorites that include the United Order of Ex-Boozers, and the Harlem Club of Former Alcoholic Degenerates. <laughs> and that's right around the first decade of the 20th century. To the right, uh, in 1880, we're going to get the Salvation Army come to the United States. And they also are going to cater a very special message to the, the chronic public inebriate and urban community. The picture is, uh, you'll see the woman here. These were what they called Salvation Army lassies who would daily walk out into the Bowery and engage these men in late stages of alcoholism and, and, and invite them to come back to the missions. And this was probably, if we want to know where are some of the first outreach workers in the United States, that's it, right there. The early treatment institutions, I wanted to get, at least give you a little visual of what these look like. Um, on the left, Dr. James Turner uh, was a physician in the Civil War, uh, had a uh, had, a, had a vision of this growing alcohol and drug problem in the United States. And he, has, he created a proposal for a United States inebriate asylum and actually registered that name, began to procure funding support for that. And he was never able to get enough support for a national treatment center. 
but he did get enough to create this. This is the New York State Inebriate Asylum. He simply lowered his horizons, created this private statewide facility. Uh, what do you think of that facility for 1864 as a treatment facility in the United States? And the inside was beautiful. The home on the right is a more typical, this is the Washingtonian home. I believe that's the one in Chicago, a sketch of it. Uh, very similar to the, the, the ones that we see in, in Boston. But most of these were actually much smaller than either of these facilities. On the left, you see the Keeley Laboratories in Dwight, Illinois. And I say the laboratories because in 1879, Leslie Keeley announced publicly, alcoholism is a disease, or drunkenness is a disease, and I can cure it. And the way he cured it was the double bichloride of gold cure for a number of things. And if you couldn't get to his treatment center, he offered it in bottled forms. So this is the cure for drunkenness, the opium habit, the tobacco habit, and neurasthenia. Does anybody even in this area know what neurasthenia is? It would later be called nervous exhaustion, and Freud would call it neurosis. So if you want to talk about where did the treatment of co-occurring disorders begin in the United States? Well, here we are, Keeley Institute. Uh, people have often asked me, Bill, what was, the, what was in that Keeley cure? People got four hypodermic injections per day while you were in the Keeley <coughs> cure, and you also got these liquid tonics in between. The liquid tonics, we know, contain uh, not only uh, stimulants, uh, arsenic, strychnine, don't, don't be shocked. These are, I, I know these are poisons, but they were also typical stimulants used in medicines during this time period. But they also included, uh, in some cases, powerful nauseant medications. So that people were told they could drink as much as they want to once they got, as soon as the medication kicked in, you were going to be cured anyway. So what do you think began to happen? Anyone who drank got the special blue bottle. And the blue bottle was this very powerful nausea. So what do you think this is the beginning of? This is, this is the, yeah, if you want to trace it back, this is the beginning of aversive conditioning, right, in the treatment of alcoholism. It's also going to have a long and pretty exotic history. Uh, we also know there were times that this, this, this formula changed multiple times because the Keeley cure is going to go well into the 20th century. Uh, there, there are times this, con this contained heavy metals, meaning that people were seriously injured, if not poisoned, maybe even in some cases killed by this. And we know at least one, one short period of time that we're almost sure that it contained cocaine hydrochloric, which was fairly typical because cocaine was being widely used as a treatment for morphine during this time period. In fact, as a sidelight, I, I think I got time to tell this very quick story. Uh, during this time period that Keeley's taken off, which is the 18, late 1870s, uh, one of the amazing things that I've run into in the treatment of addiction is a period in which pounds, and I did say pounds, of cocaine were prescribed for the treatment of morphine addiction. So I want to describe a case study in a medical journal. So in terms of an evidence-based treatment, this was an evidence-based treatment, right? In, in, the, in 1878 and 1879, a doctor, uh, Black, describes the cure of a female morphine addict by prescribing her two and one half pounds of cocaine. And, and he reports that after she had used this, she was much encouraged and had ordered two pounds more. <laughs> and to confirm her cure, he said, and the last time I saw her, she assured me she no longer had any desire whatsoever for morphine. <laughs> Some of you may have also attempted that cure in your lifetime. <laughs> the collapse. I want to take you to, again, I want to give you the quick synopsis here. We have two major institutions that have risen. We have the rise of professionally directed addiction treatment and its many branches, elaborate, scattered across the United States. On the other hand, we have this other world, which is the world of recovery mutual aid beginning with Native American communities, through the Washingtonians, the Temperance Societies, the Ribbon Reform Clubs, and on and on. We've got these two worlds. In the first two decades of the 20th century, both of those <laughs> worlds are going to collapse. They're going to collapse for some pretty important reasons. Particularly around the treatment area is there going to be exposés of fraud and exploitation within the addiction treatment period, or uh, industry of this period. 
We're going to get exposés, for example, where people are going to go out and order all the miracle cures for addiction and then send them to a laboratory and get them tested for their ingredients. And then they're going to publish exposés that say, here are all the miracle cure products for morphine addiction that promise they contain no morphine or, or morphine substitutes. And on the right-hand column is what they all contain. And they all contain morphine, but it's more insidious than that. Because to get the morphine, you would have to fill out a little card and say how many grains of morphine you were currently addicted to. And they would promise you complete comfort in your cure. So if you wrote and said, I am currently addicted to 12 grains of opium or morphine, what do you think is going to be contained in the first bottle you receive? Not 12, but what? 14. And, and again, they're promising no opiates or opiate substitutes. So in the name of treatment, tell me what's happening to tissue tolerance, to narcotics. In the name of treating addiction, we're doing what? Physiologically, we're developing even more intractable patterns of addiction through this. This is not going to be the end of harm in the name of health in addiction treatment, unfortunately. As these begin, get, begin to be exposed, we're going to get a backlash against treatment. We're also going to get schisms within the field. The inebriate homes are going to battle the inebriate asylums. The inebriate asylum leaders are going to battle the private addiction cure institutes, charging that each other's are what? Frauds and con men. So, so the fact that all these battles are getting played out publicly, what begins over time to happen? The public image of addiction treatment as a new cultural institution. It becomes really damaged. By the way, anybody got any sense of deja vu with any of this I'm describing? Third, there was a lack of scientific foundation to support addiction treatment during this time period, meaning that when a spotlight was finally shown on these institutions, and they were said, show us the data that this is effective. Because by the way, they were, they were promising in some cases 100% cures rates. How long do you think it took before everyone in the culture knew someone for whom these treatments had not worked? And as that occurred, what do you think happened to people's perceptions of treatment? Do you think there might have been a few celebrities heading off for the Keeley Cure with great publicity surrounding those events? Uh, yeah, I, I don't want to go there yet quite yet. Age, aging of leadership. We had people that birthed these institutions in the 1850s, 1860s, 1870s. Grew, grew this field as they aged through their life cycle. And now we, get, now we get mostly men, some women, leaders in this field who are, who are dying and disengaging as they age. And who's going to take their place? They didn't deal with the issue of leadership development and leadership succession. And as a result, when this field faces a huge crisis in the opening two decades of the 20th century, no one's going to be there. There are going to be no seasoned voices because all those people have disengaged. Anybody want to guess the current age of leadership and addiction treatment in the United States? We are right now in the midst of a mass exodus of long, long tenured leaders within the addiction treatment community. And by the way, also in some areas in terms of the addiction recovery community. Agree? So there's some real questions about as we go through these abrupt leadership transitions. Will we have leadership to carry our fellowships and to carry our institutions into the future? This is the biggie. From combinations of these, this is the one that's going to impact both treatment and it's going to impact recovery mutual aid. This culture simply became completely disillusioned with the prospects of recovery. People simply lost faith that it was even possible. And here's the conclusion they drew. Let's let the existing generation of alcoholics and addicts die off from benign neglect, and the sooner, the better. And we're going to prevent a new generation by doing two things. We're going to prohibit the sale of alcohol in the United States, and we're going to aggressively control the manufacture and distribution of opium and morphine and cocaine and the other drugs that I mentioned earlier. And we did that. Uh, in the case of alcohol, in the first two decades, more and more states are going to begin to go dry. And finally, we're going to pass national prohibition. How many of you saw the prohibition series? Okay. 
So you, you've got a great, got a wonderful visual story of that period of our history that's going to begin around 1919. 1914, we're going to pass a law called the Harrison Act. It's going to say for a physician to prescribe narcotics to a confirmed addict, they must have a license, and to have a license, you must pay a tax, but the only people we're going to give a license to are physicians. Now, before this, you could buy heroin over the counter, right? You could buy heroin in grocery stores. All, the, all these drugs were in all, every kind of patent medicine imaginable. So all we said was, in 1940, we're not going to, this is not, we're not banning this. We're simply saying physicians will be the gatekeeper. So we have this intractable pool of addicts who now have to go to physicians to maintain them, which they did. In 1919, the Supreme Court made a decision that said the following. For a physician to maintain an addict on their usual and customary dose is not in good faith medical practice and a violation of the Harrison Act. And in that moment, we criminalize the status of addiction in the United States. And we're going to put, we're going to arrest, we're going to send 2,500 physicians to prison and arrest 25,000 physicians between 1919 and 1935. So you want to know physician ambivalence about treating addiction? Think of the cultural memory in our history of what it meant for a physician to take this on. We have addicts crawling out of the woodwork. So between 1919 and 1924, 44 communities in the United States set up morphine maintenance clinics. Okay, Long before anybody's heard of a drug called methadone. And they did that, by the way, often run by police departments or public health departments to treat intractable addiction within their communities because they didn't want to feed illicit industries that might rise up in those communities. The legal challenges to those uh, resulted in virtually all of those clinics being closed by 1924, and as of 1924, the status of being a drug addict in the United States is to be a criminal. And the status for a physician to treat this condition through a maintenance modality is also to be a criminal. Uh, one of the, what's, what's, what's important here is a couple of things. Um, before I get to what's gonna go on with mutual aid during the transition, when the addiction treatment institutions collapsed, we transferred cultural authority for the management of alcohol and drug problems to several institutions. First, we transferred it to penal institutions. We set up inebriate penal colonies, which were sort of work camps, if you will, for the chronic public inebriate and also for addicts. One of the sidebars of that, particularly on the narcotic side, is that to be in possession of narcotics in violation of the Harrison Act is a violation of federal law. So if you get busted, where do you do time? You're doing time. And if you, so the federal prisons are literally filling up with addicts. And that's going to create the momentum in 1929 to pass a law that says we need to create special prison hospitals for the treatment of these addicts that are filling our prison system. And the first one's going to open in 1935 in Lexington, Kentucky and the second one in 1938 in Fort Worth. And we're gonna revisit that story shortly when I talk about the rise of Narcotics Anonymous in the United States. But let's talk a little bit about what's going on here. Transition period. We lose basically the ribbon reform, the last of the recovery mutual aid societies are for the most part gone by the time we get to the year 1900. We are gonna to begin to see groups like the United Order of Ex-Boozers. We're gonna get, and I picked that one because it was close to us, down in Chicago. And they would do things called the Boozer's Brigade, which they would take these folks in recovery and they'd make a sweep of the Bowery, you know, bringing people into these meetings with these charismatic recovery speakers, hoping to kind of tip those scales of ambivalence of people. Uh, I mentioned the former Club of Alcoholic Degenerates, also around 1905. And the alternatives I mentioned was we got the inebriate penal colony, secondly, the psychiatric hospitals are going to become major. What we did was we, we took people out of a specialized addiction treatment facilities and we basically moved them to the back wards of what were already aging state psychiatric hospitals, which in their early days were a reform movement to get the mentally ill out of the, the poor houses in this country. Let me tell you what that did. What that meant was, with the collapse of the understanding of addiction as a primary disorder, meant that 
whatever will come into vogue for the next 50 years will be indiscriminately applied to alcoholics and addicts who are in the system. So let me tell you what those treatments include. In the first two decades, we're going to have the birth of mandatory sterilization laws of the mentally ill and the developmentally disabled as part of a movement called the eugenics movement. It's a movement to purify the civilization, particularly of this country. So we're going to eliminate defectives through le a mandatory legal sterilization. And that law also included who? Alcoholics and addicts. We don't have evidence that a lot of men got sterilized through that law. Because as many of you know with the progression of alcoholism in that period, by the time alcoholism becomes visible and evident and has done most of its damage, these men have long ago sown their seeds and most of them now become impotent. Can I just be clear with you now about this? <laughs> so, so did that affect a lot of men? No. But what I need to tell you is it affected a lot of alcoholic women. <coughs> One of my early jobs was screening alcoholics and addicts in the state hospitals in the state of Illinois in 1969 for potential release back to the community in the heydays of deinstitutionalization. And for women alcoholics, I began to very quickly notice a pattern in the medical charts that I reviewed. This phrase, discharge contingent upon voluntary sterilization. Oh. So the second you were a female and the second alcoholism showed up, you were very, very high risk to be subject to mandatory sterilization. And by the way, not, also in the name of treatment, yeah, they, they, there were early concerns about the genetic transmission of alcoholism expressed then very vaguely. But the other rationale was sterilization will reduce the exciting forces that are continuing to propel alcoholism. So we're going to sterilize people in the name of treatment. Next, as we move forward, we're going to have major innovations within the psychiatric community. We're going to have in innovations such as psychosurgery, if we believe that addiction is a function of personality, if there is a, an addictive personality, then why not treat it by a surgical procedure that fundamentally alters personality? So we did prefrontal lobotomies on alcoholics. Freeman and Watts, the great pioneers of psychosurgery in the United States, are going to do multiple psychosurgeries on alcoholics. I wish I had time to tell you there's a great story about the first alcoholic who's undergone psychosurgery in the United States on Christmas Eve, 1938, and they can't find the patient three hours later. So they leave St. Elizabeth Hospital in Washington, they see, cover all the dive joints around, and they find their patient, who's pulled a baseball hat, right, over, because they weren't doing the eye, this was the earlier technique, uh, ends up at a bar, and the docs come, and he's lit, this guy is lit up, right, he's sitting on a bar stool, and the doctors walk in, thank God they found their just uh, lobotomized patient, and he announces to, to the doctors that he, they did a fine surgical procedure that he's now discovered he can get twice as tight on half the hooch. That's a quote. <laughs> We're going to have other innovations. We're going to have a chemo and electroconvulsive therapies. If we believe there's no such thing as, as addiction, only untreated depression, and we have this wonderful new innovation of ECT, right, as a treatment for depression, then why not treat our alcoholics to treat not the, what we know is the real underlying problem, which is primary depression. So how many alcoholics do you think in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s would undergo ECT as a treatment for their alcoholism? By the way, many of you have seen One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. That movie's no joke, because the alcoholics, sometimes much smarter than their caretakers, pulled amazing shenanigans inside these institutions. Agree? And as an act of retaliation, just like in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, you began to see some of these retaliatory kind of things, all done, by the way, in the name of treatment. Because Lord knows there would be no problem with counter-transference here. <laughs> Private sanitary and hospitals, we are going to see the birth, as the, as the old systems collapse, we're going to see the birth of private hospitals that are going to special in sanitaria that may not even be in their name, but they're going to specialize in the treatment of alcoholism and drug addiction. We're going to have places like Charlestown's Hospital, right? Mm -hmm. Where a, a chronic alcoholic by the name of Bill Wilson is going to get admitted in the fall of 1934. Are you with me here? Mm -hmm. this, these early rise of private sanatory and hospitals, hidden culturally, that the affluent can get into. How many of you believe if you've got money, you'll always get treatment for addiction? Oh, yeah. 
I don't know, I ain't saying anything about the quality of that treatment, <laughs> but, but in terms of access to get the booze and, and dope sucked out of your body, that w I promise you that will be available if history is any indication. So this is the transition period. The mid 20th century, just very quickly, we're gonna kind of set the stage for this. We're gonna see the, the rise of Alcoholics Anonymous. In 1935, we're gonna have the first woman, one of the first women to achieve sustained recovery uh, in AA, Marty Mann. In 1944, is gonna create an organization called the National Committee for Education on Alcoholism with a very simple idea. All she wants to do, this humble, young, early in her recovery alcoholic woman, is simply going to change how the country sees alcoholism and the alcoholic. She's going to convince this country that alcoholism is an illness, therefore the alcoholic is a sick person, the alcoholic can be helped, the alcoholic deserves being helped, and in those years she said alcoholism is our number four public health problem and deserving of public support. Meaning it's time the federal and state governments begin to allocate money to set up treatment systems, and she was saying, it's time we begin to move this person from systems of, of punishment and control to systems of care. 1944, it's gonna take those recovery advocates she creates around the country through the 1940s, 1950s, and 1960s to lay the groundwork starting in 1970 with the legislation for the birth of modern addiction treatment. We're going to see if she's going to do that, then we have to have, we have, to have replicable treatment modalities for this to, for, if we're going to spread this national treatment system. And those modalities are going to come in a couple of ways. On the alcoholism side, they're going to come through an outpatient model of treatment pioneered at the Yale clinics in Connecticut, at Yale University. The Yale, uh, 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 most of us today think of Rutgers School of Alcohol Studies. Uh, preceding that was the Yale School of Alcohol Studies, and the clinic system they set up also began to hire some of the first recovering people as lay therapists to work and run these outpatient models. We had a residential model emerge in the state of Minnesota in 1948, 49, and 1950 with three facilities. What were they? Hazelton. Wilmer State Hospital, Pioneer House. And in the interaction between these three facilities is going to create a very unique model of residential treatment of alcoholism that will in the modern era be called 12-step facilitation. And that model is a model that can be replicated in community after community. So later we're going to see a virtual army of people around the country and world traveling to Minnesota and basically stealing everything that's not nailed down and going back to their local communities to replicate it. And I know because I was part of the army going there in 1973 and 74. Now, on the, uh, we also get, we also have this problem of the, the chronic public inebriate. And for that, we're gonna go to Canada and we're gonna take a social setting detox model that's emerged in Canada. And all of a sudden say, we can now decriminalize public intoxication because if we set up social setting detox programs, who we now have a protocol that can safely detox if we have hospital care as a backup to that unit. So this was the days of the, set the stage for the decriminalization of alcoholism and social setting detox replication. On the drug side, I gotta tell you, our, our treatment programs in Lexington and Fort Worth had generally 95 to sometimes 100% relapse rates in the studies of them. So there's, there was a lot of pessimism about the treatment of, 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 of addiction. And I want to talk a bit about, our, about NA and, and kind of where that came. But I want to, before we get to the NA part of the story, I want to say that what happened was out of the, out of the failure of Lexington and Fort Worth to provide viable long-term recovery for opiate addicts, we had this vacuum of need that's going to get filled in two ways. We're going to have the emergence of therapeutic communities in the 1950s, beginning with Synanon in 1958. And it's mass replication around the United States. I was part of that tradition. From Synanon to Daytop to Gateway in Chicago and on and on and on. We're going to replicate more than 500 therapeutic communities by the time we get to the mid-1970s. The second thing we're going to get is six, in 1964-65, we're going to have Drs. Dole and Nicewander pioneer methadone maintenance in the United States. And it's going to be rapidly replicated through the 1970s 
and into part of the 1980s. Now, coming back to our mutual aid story, almost everything I've said by way of mutual aid so far has been mutual aid related to recovery from alcoholism. What Lexington's going to do for the first time is bring large numbers of addicts into one place. And I guarantee you, if you do that, you will have a lot of interesting behaviors going on in that institution. <laughs> but do you also think we're going to create a climate at some point for recovery movements to begin to rise up? And that's what we're going to see. And we're going to see this complicated history of Narcotics Anonymous we'll refer to later. Beginning not as Narcotics Anonymous, but beginning as Addicts Anonymous in, Lex in Lexington, Kentucky. And Danny C. is going to leave Lexington and go to New York City, but you can't have an Addicts Anonymous because that would mean two AAs in New York City. So he called his fellowship Narcotics Anonymous when he got to New York City. So you're going to say the, the, the sort of birth of early NA in New York City. Um, 13 steps. For all practical purposes, no tradition. <laughs> you have any hints of what that might spell for their future? <laughs> Um, and we are, we're, we're going to get a, a very struggling existence from East Coast NA that's going to begin to, to spread almost by word of mouth into some cities. Uh, there are a couple of us here that have got family members deeply connected to that history uh, that are very much a part of this movement of NA, in, particularly into some of our Midwestern cities. Um, we're also going to get on the West Coast at the same kind of time period, and I'm really talking now like pre-1953, uh, early efforts to kind of create specialty AA meetings for addicts. Uh, we're going to have some of those people kind of pull a group out of AA. It's kind of a quasi-AA meeting, but it's a special meeting for hypes and alcoholics called HIAL. And this is going to predate the 1953 beginning of Narcotics Anonymous as we know it today with Jimmy K and moving forward. I need to also tell you that in 1959, NA virtually disintegrated, came to a dead stop, nearly died. Jimmy K had already disengaged, came back in in 1959, rebreathed life into NA, and basically led the beginning of the rise and, and spread of NA. Uh, so let's go next. Uh, yes. Okay, I need to stay on this side, so I'm a walker, so that'll be tough, but we'll do it. Thank you for letting me know that. Um, I want to I first talk about, a, very quickly, AA significance before we jump in to do sort of the rest of this story. First off, there, I want to talk about things that, that are going to show up in AA that, that really weren't new. Uh, they really did reflect uh, things that we saw in earlier groups, but I want to mention with that that they weren't derivative. We don't have evidence, for example, that Bill Wilson even knew of these earlier groups in 1938 and 39 when the 12 steps were getting formulated. What we do know, uh, and you can imagine, in 1945 there was an AA Grapevine article on the Washingtonian. And as far as we know, this is Bill Wilson's discovery of this huge recovery mutual aid society that existed a century before who died from almost the exact same problems that AA was currently going through in the 1940s. So if you want to talk about panic and the, birth, the motivation for the traditions and almost a compulsive drive to begin to articulate principles that could protect AA from them, we really get it during this time period. Here are some of these that we get. Clear problem admission, uh, whether we're talking about the first step of AA or we're talking about signing the pledge in 1840. Public or semi-public commitment to sobriety. Uh, the function of sober fellowship. Experience sharing meetings. This classic three-part story style that says what? This is the way it was. <laughs> this is what happened, and this is what? This is how it is now. Uh, we see that three-part story style going almost as far back. So that story style itself was not unique. We also get this, the, the mentoring. We got peer mentoring going back at least as far as some of the Native American cultural revitalization movements, and it was clearly evident through the Washingtonian and the Ribbon Reform Clubs. So what were some of these in innovations? This is one of the biggies. Um, if you look at all of the earlier movements predating the birth of Alcoholics Anonymous, 
Recovery from alcoholism or drug, thank you, drug addiction is predicated on sort of asserting oneself, asserting control. The, the Washingtonians almost did man up, you know? The part of your manhood was fighting king alcohol and winning. So you get these incredible sense of struggles and battles and control, and it's sort of like, you know, the, the, it really is about self. So, you know, we get a lot of this, uh, out of this tradition, we're going to go all the way back to the 1800s and right now, and you'll have a lot of people talk about what you got to do to recovery. You got to have self knowledge, you got to have self assertion, you got to have self awareness, and they just go on and on. Self empowerment, and they go on and on. And what AA said was, we don't like any of them self hyphenated words. <laughs> because you know what? The self is the problem, it's not the solution. What they did was, that recovery within 12-step fellowships was posited not as an assertion of self, but as a transcendence of self. That the recovery process itself was not a process of getting into yourself, but a process of getting out of yourself. So they really viewed it as a process of other orientation, including relationship outside oneself with, with some transcendent power. In fact, they said, the, the very beginning of alcoholism, or the very beginning of recovery, is posited on the fact that all efforts of self-control and self-assertion have failed. Focus on long-term recovery. What did I say the others? All the others focused on, how do we get this alcoholic to stop drinking? And they didn't even think about it. They said, that, hey, stop and drink is not the problem. Real alcoholics have stopped drinking a thousand times. The issue is what? How do you not start? Right? One stop. So, so the entire focus shifts from this idea of recovery initiation to how do you build a long-term life and reconstruct one's character where you can live inside your skin without picking up a drink. Very, very, very dramatic shift. In earlier periods, we had battles between the power of religion to incite recovery and the power of self, particularly humanism. The Washingtonians got accused of the sin of humanism because they put their own power above the power of Jesus you know, in, the, in the Christian days of the temperance movement. AA, for the first time, charted a pathway right between those and completely avoided those two arguments, although it surfaced a bit lately. Uh, and what they did was they began to posit a spiritual framework of long-term recovery that was not a religious nor was it a secular framework. So this, this, this notion of spirituality as sort of the essence of recovery was, was fairly innovative at that time. The other thing that happened was, A, was very fortunate that Bill Wilson had writing skills, which Dr. Bob had none of. Bill Wilson would write lengthy letters to Bob, and, and Bob would respond on a prescription pad, two sentences. <laughs> so if we were waiting for the literature to come from Akron, we were in serious trouble here. But Bill Wilson had the ability to begin to collectively e extract from the experience of those first sober members and say what? These are the steps suggested, and on and on, right? And, and, and really codify that. This is 1939, they, and Bill's 100. Bill was always a little grand deal. They didn't have 100 members yet in 1939. But my point is they got, they got what the essence of this program was before they underwent rapid growth, which meant what? They found a way to protect the program from corruption by codifying these, these very clear principles. And then when it looked like in the, in the 1940s that AA could virtually disintegrate from within, uh, we be, you, be, you began to see a similar codification by way of the traditions that will come to govern AA and many of the other 12-step programs. Uh, they maintained their closed meeting structure, which many of the earlier groups gave up with. What they understood was the essence of this initial engagement in recovery is a process of mutual identification. And we do that through a process of what? We don't give advice, we tell our stories. And suddenly I identify my life in your story and vice versa. So this, this importance of mutual identification and the, 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 the credentials there were no educational credentials that you could get you into AA. There were no scientific credentials. That could, the, the, the only credential that was required had to be an experiential credential. 
and it was presented not in the form of here's my resume, but here's my story. Very, very innovative. Unique organizational structure that everyone outside of recovering alcoholics close to AA in the 1930s and 40s swore that AA was doomed to self-destruction. That it was a non-organization. I mean, it's anarchy. How on earth could this thing survive over time? Because they created this incredibly decentralized. Because what did they understand? If there's anything that alcoholics and addicts detest, power, authority, <laughs> you know, we aren't very hurtable, you know, as a group. And we don't play well together sometimes. So the idea that if we elected leaders, we would destroy them, so then why not, not have leaders? and decentralize all of this with, at, a, at a group level. Radical, radical. And in fact, there are people who've argued that a century from now, AA may be more known historically for this unique organizational structure than its remedy for the condition of alcoholism. Creative management of the five Ps through the tradition. Don't have time for these, but here's what they are. Personality and egos. The, the issue of charismatic leadership. The question has always been, can a recovery mutual aid society outlive its founding generation? And that was still open to question. And I would argue to you historically that without the tradition, AA would have been unlikely to have outlived its founding generation. But with those traditions in place and the service structure that then came into place, that was possible. AA remains the standard by which we judge others for very simple reasons. One is its size. It's geographical dispersion uh, internationally, it's historical longevity, the number and methodological rigor of AA research, which now, which now numbers in the thousands of studies, the adaptions of other problems of living, the influence on addiction treatment, and its visibility within the treatment as a whole. So now let's begin to move forward in terms of the update. I wanna do two pieces to this. In terms of the 1970 to 2000, we see the dramatic growth of 12-step groups during this period. And we see, I asked Ernie Kurtz at one point um, if he was going to do uh, an, a, another, a new book on AA. Sort of what would its theme be and what might its title be? And what his answer was, I thought was very provocative because he said, if I was going to do it again, I would probably call this, this part of the story, the modern story, the varieties of AA experience. <laughs> And what he was talking about was the incredible diversification of what the experience is within the AA fellowship. And you see that in terms of um, sort of the, the, the incredible ways that the, of meet, the meeting formats, the specialty groups, things that would have been almost impossible to have recognized from earlier time periods. In, in terms of the spiritual frameworks, again, we've got historically AA, NA in terms of its three key early kind of founding milestones. I wish, I wish we had more time for me to really do more on NA for this reason. Uh, most of the other 12-step fellowships down here are relatively self-contained. Some of them, for the most part, very short-lived. Many of them very localized. NA is very significant, one, in terms of also its very dramatic growth during this modern period after really struggling to survive through the 50s into the 60s. People tend to see AA as a clone of AA, meaning that we do, we'll do a research study, and instead of a study on AA, it'll say, it'll, it's a study of 12-step programs, and all we've studied is AA, and we assume anything we've studied on AA automatically applies to NA. How many of you in this room who have a little bit of knowledge in this area believe that NA has a very distinct culture? in contrast to AA, that you can, you can sense if you've been in the tables and in the rooms long, sense almost instantaneously. The differences in language, differences in rituals. I would su suggest when Jimmy K. reframed the first step of NA in 1954, in a century from now, we will look back on that as an amazing revolution in thinking and understanding about the nature of this disorder, not linked to a particular drug, but to a broader process he labeled addiction in 1954, an amazing moment in NA history. And I, and I wish we would have opportunities to break out and do more studies really focused on NA and that people would begin to see NA as the very distinct culture of recovery that it is. In addition to these many, many variations of 12-step programs, and you see they've continued to proliferate, we also get the current 
Wellbriety movement, sometimes referred to as the Red Road of Recovery in Indian country, that in many ways is a, at times appears to be a kind of adaptation of 12-step spirituality, and others uh, seems to really break from that and really incorporate lots of historical Native American culture as a framework of recovery. Further specialization, of course, we've got the, the first recognition that there's this independent family recovery process. And we see that beginning to be articulated through the birth of Al-Anon and al and other family-based support structures. And we begin to get the early notion that if we really say there is a thing called family recovery, how does it differ from personal recovery? And, we, and this sets the stage for people like Stephanie Brown, who begins to study families and burst the illusion that if we just get the alcoholic sober, the family will spontaneously heal. And what Stephanie and, and Virginia and their work began to suggest was recovery is very destabilizing to families. And if there's not an independent recovery process, families that absorb every insult addiction has to offer, and as sick as they may be, somehow hung together as families, may disintegrate in early recovery. And everybody in this room has seen examples of that, agree? Families that survive that, and we suddenly see the disintegration of this relationship, partnership, marriage, in early recovery. We see the occupational specialization beginning, and this, could go, this list could have been very long. I just gave a few examples here, which is part of what Ernie's referring to in terms of this growing varieties and people in recovery beginning to organize occupationally. We also get the beginning uh, co-occurring problems, uh, DDA, Recovery Anonymous, DTR in particular, we're getting a more recent phenomena of recovery emerging framework specifically around people who've been enmeshed in the criminal justice system. I'm very in, in, interested in, in, in inner circles, which are these recovery groups organized inside the prison systems in the United States, who when they leave prisons and enter their communities, enter what is called winner's community, of members who, who have left prison, maintained their recovery, and this is a a recovery fellowship based very specifically on people who bring those very specific obstacles of also being a felon in recovery. Uh, meeting specialization, I, this, I could have made this list 10 slides. <laughs> I mean, I've almost given up. Anybody that's looked at a meeting list lately, you go, oh my God. Not only at the number, but the amazing variety of specialization uh, related to that. Secular re uh, recovery support groups, this, this history, and this is the beginning of the modern piece that I want to share with you. We get the Women for Sobriety 75, SOS 85, Rational Recovery, um, Men for Sobriety, Life Ring Secular Recovery, Moderation Management 94, begun here actually, there's kind of an Ann Arbor history with that, with Audrey Kishline, and Life Ring Secular Recovery after that. What's interesting about that is these are the first modern secular alternatives to the spiritual frameworks of 12-step recovery. We're also going to begin to see during that time sort of a migration towards some more explicitly religious frameworks of recovery, beginning with what we might call 11-step group of the Calix Society of Catholics and Alcoholics Anonymous who are using the Catholic faith, particularly in terms of 11, the 11 step. Uh, we, we get the birth of Alcoholics Anonymous, which are victorious, which is the first adaptation of the 12 steps for a Christ-centered framework of recovery. We get Teen Challenged, Alcoholics for Christ. We get Jacks in 1979, another framework we might refer to as 11-step group for, for uh, Jewish people in, in Alcoholics Anonymous. And then I could go on, but this is probably one I'd want to footnote, and that is Celebrate Recovery. If I look at the current history right now in the United States, probably the fastest growing recovery support structure in the United States is not AA or NA, but Celebrate Recovery, now in about 10,000 churches. <coughs> And again, this is going to be part of this larger pattern that I'm going to be sharing with you momentarily. If any of you are interested in staying up with this, uh, Ernie and Linda Kurtz here in Ann Arbor uh, volunteered and began some work with Faces and Voices of Recovery to create a recovery mutual aid directory. Uh, they've now passed that on to some others of us, and we try to update this about every 30 to 60 days. So if you're wanting the very latest menu of all of these 12-step, spiritual, religious, secular frameworks of recovery, there's where you can find them. The current trends. I want to talk about 
we've begun to talk about this shift from talking about recovery community as a single entity. Um, I'll, I'll never forget one of the nights that I was, um, Ernie Kurtz and I were in deep conversation about what was unfolding nationally here. You know, and, and, I'll, and I remember Ernie reached a point where we were talking about all these varieties of new groups. And, and he said, you know, maybe it's time we really stop talking about recovery community and began to talk about communities of recovery. The communities of recovery was more accurately describing what's going on in the ground. And when we use the term recovery community, we're really talking not about a 12-step community, but all of those diverse communities collectively. And that's a kind of shift historically in consciousness. We're getting the cultural and political awakening across religious, spiritual, and secular frameworks. I'm going to describe hundreds of thousands of people marching in the streets this past month, not as AA members or NA members or moderation management members or any other kind of members, but marching as people in recovery. And that, I mean, that shift in consciousness that we can have people walking side by side, seeing themselves as this larger concept of people in recovery is without historical precedent. Very, very significant in terms of what we're going to describe that's going to flow out of that. We're beginning to get new recovery support institutions, and we're going to get new, all kinds of new cultural development. I'm going to describe a few of these very quickly, and then we're going to give you some visual images of some of this. We are beginning to see the diversification of peer-based recovery support societies. We are seeing a, a, a well-organized new recovery advocacy movement rise within the United States. Recovery advocates came together in 2001 in St. Paul, Minnesota, and launched this movement, and now basically are organizing grassroots recovery advocacy organizations around the country. With the idea not of competing with recovery mutual aid organizations, but actually trying to create a world in which recovery can flourish. Are you with me? Where the recovery mutual aid groups focus on the personal and family recovery experience. This is really about changing the world, changing policy, changing attitudes, dramatically increasing recovery support resources within communities. And what we're saying out of that in many cases is the tipping point of recovery may rely as much maybe rely not just on what your personal assets and liabilities are, but the assets and liabilities of that community. How many times have you seen someone treated and treated and responded well in a treatment institution only to be sent back to a community or a school or a neighborhood that devoured them within 48 hours? So the new recovery advocacy movement is to say, if we're really concerned about addiction, it's time we took to recovery where addiction is at. So what we're talking about is virtually bringing a message of recovery into every dope copping community in this country. You remember Willie Sutton? They said, Willie, why do you keep robbing those banks? Willie Sutton was a famous bank robber. And what did Willie always say? That's where the money's at, right? <laughs> it's the same kind of thing. If we're really serious about addiction, what the hell are we doing isolating ourselves in these closed therapeutic communities? How about how about getting out of our offices into the lives of our community and take the recovery message where it is most desperately needed? And that's part of what's coming out of this movement, and I'll show you examples of that. We're seeing grassroots recovery community organizations not only doing advocacy, but setting up some new recovery support centers that I'll describe. We're seeing the recovery home or recovery residence movement grow dramatically in this country. This is a fundamentally new institution. Don't be disillusioned here. This is not the halfway house of yesteryear. It is not the three-quarter way house. This is not, for the most part, the professionally staffed facility. These are members in a recovery community creating physical residences where early fragile recovery can be protected and stabilized and nurtured. And you can stay as long as you want, and there are two rules universally across. Pay your rent. Don't pick up, okay? Love, couldn't talk about keep it simple. So, okay, so now I got a recovery, I got an environment in this fragile thing I got called recovery. I got an environment that's supporting that. And now I wanna go to work. So how about a recovery, how about recovery conducive employment? Okay, and now we're getting recovery industries. We're getting recovery friendly industries. We're getting people in recovery who are entrepreneurs 
who are basically creating a workforce, only hiring people in recovery, supervisors in recovery. They take breaks and do lunch meetings. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy. You're saturated in recovery in the context of working your way back into the mainstream workforce. But let's say I don't want to work yet. I've always, I wanted to go back to school. <coughs> let's say I got a, I'm a parent and I've got a 19-year-old kid who's just graduating from high school because he missed a couple of years doing research, right? <laughs> but now his research is done, he's ready to go to college. And I've got to tell you, as a parent, I am terrified. Why? i got a kid less than a year in recovery, and I'm sending him into an abstinence, hostile environment, which is my definition of an American college or university. Okay, abstinence, hostile environment. So the question is, is there some place I can send my child, or my child can choose to go, where they'll have incredible degrees of recovery support on that campus. In other words, they can, they can go and they can get their schooling, but they can, they can also pursue their early recovery career through that process. So we're seeing the recovery school movement both in high schools and at the college level. And I was delighted to hear news of the Student Recovery Association here in this community today. So it's nice to know some of those uh, that I'm describing are getting here. We're seeing recovery ministries, churches, and colonies. Churches that in the 1980s, believe me, did not have their arms open and welcome to people who were addicted and people with HIV are now doing what? Launching aggressive recovery ministries out of these churches. I'm not talking about giving the basement room for a meeting. I'm talking about recovery pastors. I'm talking about people telling recovery yeah. stories from the pulpits of these churches. I'm talking about running faith-based recovery support groups like Celebrate Recovery as part of the ministry of the church. Talking about people in recovery doing outreach in the community out of these churches. That is, in many ways, without precedent. Let me give you some images here. I want to put this in historical context. Um, in 1976, 52 prominent Americans stepped forward publicly and announced their recovery from alcoholism. It was an amazing moment in history. You know who they were? Some of you remember? We had doctors and lawyers and astronauts and sports figures. Yeah, this was the National Council of Alcoholism's Operation Understanding. And they repeated it again a couple years later. 52 people. I got to tell you, it was an amazing moment in the history of, of modern recovery to have 52 people stand up and talk not about any affiliation with any recovery fellowship, but to stand up as what? To say I was once sick, and today I'm in well, and my family's well, and you can be too. There, recovery is a reality in the lives of a large number of people well hidden in this culture. At that moment, I gotta tell you, it, I, it was just an amazing moment for me as a person in recovery. If someone would have told me, Bill, in your lifetime, there will be more than 100,000 people in recovery marching the streets publicly every September. And that you'll be part of that. And you'll be standing up, speaking to some of those groups, and looking out, seeing recovering people and their families as far as the eyes can see. Now, some of us seen a whole lot of people in conventions and stuff, right? I mean, we, we filled the amphitheaters, and, that, and it's impressive. That's an amazing experience. But I got to tell you, when you take... 15,000 people that just marched in Philadelphia this last month and have them marching on the streets of Philadelphia as a person to That is a very, very different experience. And that's what we're having. Uh, we're having these very, very large recovery celebration events. We're having very assertive recovery advocacy going on. These are, at, these are people in recovery regularly going to Washington, D.C. to train to be recovery advocates to push recovery-focused policies, and to, by the way, to transform addiction treatment in the United States, as I've witnessed some of that being transformed at Don Farm. Because one of the things that movement says is somewhere along our way as a treatment profession, we got distracted. And this thing we call treatment got disconnected from the larger and much more enduring process of recovery. And treatment programs that grew out of grassroots communities somehow got disconnected from them, com those communities in the process of their professionalization and commercialization. And what that movement is saying is it's time we reconnected addiction treatment 
to long-term addiction recovery. So we're having this thing, just talking about what everybody's talking about, recovery management, recovery-oriented systems of care, and on and on. And some of it's getting bastardized all the hell in terms of its implementation. But if you want to know where the momentum of that is coming from, it's really coming from people in recovery. We're having the Wellbriety movement. Uh, uh, much of the self-help movement in the United States outside of the early Native American history has been dominated by a sort of white Caucasian male culture. One of the things that's amazing about the contemporary recovery advocacy movement is the deep involvement of communities of color in this movement from its very beginning. And I must say that the Native American Wellbriety movement, this is Don Coyas, um, founder of White Bison in Colorado, has had an enormous Im influence on, on this movement. In terms of cultural development, we're beginning to see, I, I want you to think of this almost in tandem with what we saw in terms of the women's movement and the civil rights movement and LBGT liberation movements and others. This is a kind of cultural development where people are becoming very, very interested in the history of recovery in the United States and the history of fellowship. We've got AA history lovers. We got, we got people so rabid about NA history, you can't even comprehend it, what the links they'll go to and the battles they'll have about the smallest nuances of NA history. And by the way, you, it looks crazy and insane, you know? But I want to suggest it's part of this larger process of cultural development of recovering people as a people. We're beginning to get identity reconstruction that I talked about, a language audit, where people are beginning to challenge language. We're beginning to say things like, how on earth can you call a medical disorder using the term abuse? The term abuse doesn't come out of, of medicine. It comes out of morality and religion. It's assuming that abuse is an excess that flows out of sin, not a medical disorder. Lots of us are saying, stop using that language. We're saying language is important. Don Coya says, it is, and words are important. If you want to kill something, you call it a weed. If you want to love and nurture it, you call it a flower. If you want to switch, just switch the title, right? So the, there's, a, there's a lot that flows out of the language. So yes, is it political correctness? Far beyond political correctness. People have the ability to begin to step forward and define the words and language that reflect their own identities and experiences. Values definition, new symbols, musical anthems, artistic expression, literature. This is an example of a, of a flourishing recovery culture outside the identities of individual fellowships. Recovery school movement, we talked about. Is there anything I want to reference? Anybody know what two things that distinguish recovery schools? Exceptionally high recovery rates. If you were going to tell me an environment that was least likely to produce a high recovery rate, stable recovery rate without relapse, uh, I would predict a college environment is not the best place to begin to do this early work. And yet, in these recovery schools, we have two things. Overwhelming, study after study showing us exceptionally high recovery rates of these students banding together on these campuses. Uh, secondly, is very high academic achievement, and I'm, I might add a third, and the third is this. I walk onto a, camp, a Texas Tech University campus on a Wednesday night to an open 12-step meeting. There are 200 students there. I know they got 40 students in a scholarship program for their recovery program of this recovery school. So I'm thinking, well, who in the hell are the rest of these people? And I'm asking, you know, wh who are all these people? Because they're students, obviously. It's not like people coming in from the community. And they said, well, it's really interesting because right now, one student a week from the larger community enters recovery through their contact with our recovery students on campus. What did I say earlier? Recovery is contagious. And as you begin to seed recovery in these institutions, you begin to transform uh, some of them in very dramatic ways. Uh, grassroots recovery community organizations, recovery home movement we talked about, uh, Recovery industries we talked about, recovery ministries and churches. We even have recovery churches where the entire identity of the church is as a recovery church. Until pretty soon people who aren't in recovery start fighting to get into it, which is a very interesting kind of phenomenon. Um, cultural development between and within. And again, we have these kind of characters. I want to just give you some, some images 
Uh, these are images from this larger cultural development and these new institutions that are coming. <laughs> Drug testing today, hold it, right? <laughs> and st student student uh, recovery school. Uh, recovery within faith communities. Uh, again, I'm amazed at what's going on in terms of some of the recovery ministries. This is one of my, my all-time favorite signs. This is a, a woman with the name of Susan Rook um, uh, coined this, and it, it's come out of the Missouri Recovery Network. By our silence, we have let others define us. And what, in essence, the movement has said is addiction is unbelievably visible in this culture, and its devastation is unbelievably visible. And the casualties of addiction, particularly through every celebrity rehab that tonight will be on trying to escape the consequences of their latest crash and burn experience. Agree? Yeah. The second they move into stable recovery, they disappear from the media. So what they're saying is the disease is unbelievably visible and the solution is invisible. So what are they saying? <laughs> By our silence, we have let others define us. And they're saying it is time a vanguard, oh, sorry, apologies. It is time a vanguard of people in recovery who are temperamentally suited to this role, whose family and other circumstances allow them to perform that role, to step forward not as individuals, but to step forward by the thousands and announce some basic concepts to this culture. Recovery is a reality in the lives of millions of individuals and families in this culture. There are multiple pathways of long-term recovery, and all are cause for celebration. With me? Amen. Multiple pathways. We don't fight. We don't compete. We celebrate. <coughs> this sort of motto is recovery by any means necessary under any circumstance, if you want my motto for that, OK? And, and so, so we are getting this. Um, did I include one of these? Recovery focus. Oh, please come up, because it's free. Okay, that's not doing it. Uh, we're getting the Recovery is Everywhere campaign, and some of you are going to smile when I describe this, because the, 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 the source of this is a bit anonymous, but I just want to tell you, those of you in Ann Arbor should have a very warm heart when you see this campaign. This is an incredible series, the Recovery is Everywhere campaign. Go to recoveryiseverywhere. I think it's com, org, help me. One of those, one of those, go to one of those. Type in Recovery is Everywhere, it'll get you there. Uh, we're beginning to see... You know, we had, we, we had sort of treatment centers, we had AA, and then we had this little, and NA, and we had this little thing of pimple off of called clubhouses. They were in sort of no man's land. They really weren't the fellowships, but they, were, they met some social needs of people in recovery. Well, but but they, were, they were fellowship specific, agree? This is an AA clubhouse or an NA clubhouse in many communities. What we're beginning to see now is we're beginning to see recovery community centers available for people across pathways of recovery. And those are spreading very, very rapidly right now, particularly in the Northeast. We're beginning to see media, media through television, particularly cable television. We're getting large numbers of recovery-focused radio, uh, television programs, and, and, and a real theme throughout that is large numbers of people sharing their personal and family recovery experiences. We're beginning to get people in recovery organized to begin to do service work back in to transform their community. Again, the idea is, the concept of, reco of, of community recovery is this concept. Some neighborhoods and communities, whole communities, have been so severely wounded by these problems that the community itself or the neighborhood itself needs a recovery process. So we're getting recovering people beginning to organize and focus on bringing these messages of hope, not simply to individuals still suffering, but the whole community still suffering. And they're going out in Baltimore, for example, through Recovery Corps projects, doing all kinds of acts of community service. This is uh, in, in, the, in the city of Philadelphia. Uh, the city of Philadelphia is a wonderful city of murals. For those of you who visited there know what I'm talking about. And there are a growing number of recovery-themed murals that dot the landscape within Philadelphia. They're conveying this sort of amazing message of hope. And guess where we're placing them? On the sides of pawn shops, on the walls of police stations. This is, this is one of the most beautiful ones that I have ever seen. This is a methadone clinic in the city of Philadelphia with one of the most amazing recovery murals. 
and all of the patients in treatment at this center participated in the development of this, and it was patients that wrote the poems that are both on the large mural and that fill all the walls all the way around this facility. We're beginning to see organized sports. Okay, you know that, 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 that life crisis in recovery when you wake up and say, okay, I'm clean, now what the hell do I do? You know, I mean, it's like, what do I do when I step out my door? <laughs> Other than go to a meeting and go to a clubhouse. And pretty soon your sponsor is gonna say, you know, I don't think you need more meetings. I think you need to get a life. You need a new kind of program. You know, I want you to do something other than go to meetings. Well, what we're beginning to see are recovering people beginning to organize all this incredible range of activities. One of the ones that I'm most interested in are people who are organized in all kinds of, 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 of sports competition and sports activities. Uh, we've got a, in, this, in the city of Philadelphia, a city that I work with a great deal, they've got the Clean Machine which is a recovery basketball league throughout the Northeast of all of those would-be NBA players whose addictions diverted their pathway to the NBA <laughs> are now organized and bringing basketball back into their lives uh, through the framework of these recovery <laughs> leagues. Uh, recovery and music, we're getting more and more varieties of people in recovery who are using their artistic abilities in terms of songwriting and the music that they're playing. Implications for this in closing, let me just go through a couple of them. First off, the, the alcohol and other drug problems arena is no longer simply split into the, the arena of personal family recovery and support for that, our fellowships, and then on the, on the other side, treatment. We're getting this whole new world of recovery support institutions beginning to fill up all of this space. We're beginning to see enhanced treatment effectiveness hear me clearly, by combining and sequencing professionally directed sequence, or treatment with these multiple recovery support institutions, both extremely assertive linkages to recovery fellowships and giving people choice related to that, by the way, across these secular, religious, and spiritual pathways, and then also assertively linking them to all of these new recovery support institutions. So we're slowly, truly beginning to create a, a cultural world that can so support people, particularly people, through those first years of recovery. We're beginning to see, interestingly, people with lower problem severity and a lot of, a lot of capital, a lot of recovery, we call recovery capital, internal assets and external assets and family support. Some of those are initiating recovery with mutual aid fellowships and these recovery support institutions without need of treatment. So in many ways, we're, we're once again widening the doorways of entry and saying all pathways to recovery do not go through professionally directed treatment. That should not be a cause for threat to addiction treatment programs. It should be a cause for great celebration. We're beginning to see greater focus on role of community in recovery. I simply want to end with this message from the well Bryany movement. In the, the Native American communities say historically what we've done in their communities, and I would say we've done in all of our communities, is this. We take this horribly damaged life from addiction and picture it as a sick and dying tree. And we're going to dig that sick and dying tree up from its natural environment, and we're going to carry it way over here. But get the picture. Visualize it, because I can't walk over there. <laughs> we're going to go way over there and dig a hole and put it in fresh dirt and fertilize it, and water it, and give it sun, and bring it back to life, right? And it's going to flourish. And then we're going to dig it up, and bring it back, and put it back in this hole. And then we're shocked, and what happens? It begins to die. The Native American communities are telling us, we need a healing force. It's not enough to take a sick and dying tree and transplant it. We need to treat the soil. And by treating the soil, what are they talking about? We really, we really got to bring this larger arena of recovery. And, and we need to create environments that recovery can flourish. That, I think, is the next step. How many of you, from what you've heard, feel like this last stage I've described is a very important historical shift? As a historian, that's what, you know, and, and what's fascinating is it's without precedent. So we don't know where it's going. My guess is, I'll say this in closing, I think we're going to see a level of recovery culture development, even in the next 10 years, 
that would have been absolutely unthinkable to us to have imagined in our lifetime. And, 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 and that, having that happen is going to need leaders, indigenous leaders from all across the country. What some of you don't realize is some of us old goats are about to give up the life, you know? We may not have the energy to carry forth and run this next stage of this marathon. But what some of you don't realize, particularly some of you young people here, is you may have been born for this moment in time. I mean, I feel like I was born for a moment in time to take a torch from my aging recovery minuters, who for the 40s, 50s, and 60s carried that torch and handed it to me. And I've tried to carry it now for almost 40 years. I'm ready to, uh, before long, I'm going to be handed, so get ready. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, what, what some of you don't realize, because you're going to say, you know, why me? I mean, how did so many people destroy themselves around me? And of all people, I should not be the one here clean and sober today. Why me? I mean, for what purpose? Mm -hmm. And what some of you may not realize is part of that purpose for some of you may have been to play a role in this next, next stage of the history of recovery. Not only in the United States, but the world. Because what I'm describing here is actually now a worldwide recovery advocacy and recovery support movement. In closing, one of the last times I was in this room, we had visitors from Japan here. Anybody remember? Was anybody with me? And we had Mr. and Mrs. Arai and others sitting in the back up, up at the top, almost where you're at up there. Uh, Jim Balmer and I both received separate emails <coughs> yesterday from Mr. and Mrs. Arai, who were here that night, telling us that they just had last Saturday the second public recovery march in Tokyo, Japan. Right. Now, you think we got stigma here? <laughs> think about it. I want you to think about what that event meant for those first people to walk as people in recovery on the streets of Tokyo. So, so I'm not just talking about carrying this movement here. This is an international movement. And, we're, and with the internet, we're getting so much cross-fertilization by what's going across these boundaries. It's, it's truly an amazing, amazing kind of, it's an amazing time to be in recovery, an amazing time to be professionals contributing to the development of this community. I'm sorry I've gone a bit over. Thank you so, so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you.